Okay, so in a previous video, I talked to you guys about how you can use homogeneous transformation matrices in order to derive a forward kinematics algorithm. By using the kinematics diagram, you could derive individually each homogeneous transformation matrix to end up with your final matrix by dot multiplying them together and out would come your location of the end effector. Now in this video, what I want to do is talk about a method called the Denevit-Hartenberg method. The Denevit-Hartenberg method is a method by which you can define your kinematics diagram for your robot. And then from that diagram, you can more quickly derive those homogeneous transformation matrices in order to get that same forward kinematics algorithm. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at a single frame. But remember, a kinematics diagram is a collection of multiple frames. So what we need to do is we need to derive, or define rather, our kinematics diagram such that we can derive our homogeneous transformation matrices from it. But to do so, we have to follow some rules. Let's talk about what those rules are. If we look at this info box, we can see that we have four rules we must follow when defining our kinematics diagram. The first rule is that the z-axis must be the axis of rotation for a revolute joint or the direction of motion if you have a prismatic joint. The second is that the x-axis must be perpendicular to both its own z-axis and the z-axis of the frame before it. The third is that all frames must follow the right-hand rule. And finally, each x-axis must intersect the z-axis of the frame before it. So just saying those to you guys might not make sense, but that's why I built some visuals to help show that off. So obviously we can see that if we look at our uh, frame in the background here, we can see it follows the right-hand rule and the x-axis is obviously perpendicular to its own z-axis, as you can see here. But let's go ahead and let's add a second frame to this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna scroll down here and we're gonna click on this plus button. Now what that's gonna do is it's gonna add another frame on top of our frame on the z direction. Now, as we can see, the two frames are basically identical. One is just offset by that Z. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to increase in the left side. You can see I'm increasing the Z length, which is just moving the second frame further away on the Z direction from the first frame. Now, if I go up to the Y and I start to move it, you can see that it's moving it along the Y, the green arrow, right? But I'm currently breaking a rule when I do that. If you notice, as I move that away, the red line, the x-axis of the second frame, x1, is no longer intersecting the previous z-axis. If I drew a line up from this uh, blue arrow and across from this red, they no longer intersect. I'm breaking one of those four rules we defined. So let's go ahead and put that back to zero such that we're not breaking that rule. Now, if I were to move it along the x-axis, uh, if you see this, I'm moving along the red, I'm not breaking that rule, right? So I can the theoretically put this frame here. Let's go move that back to zero though. And let's talk about how we might want to rotate this frame. So in this kinematics diagram, our second joint actually wants to be a revolute joint that is perpendicular to the first joint. So let's go ahead and let's rotate this around the x-axis by 90 degrees. When we do that, you can see that we didn't break any of the rules. The x-axis is intersecting the previous z-axis, right? We have no problems there. But let's say for whatever reason, we wanted to also rotate this 90 degrees around the z. You can see now we're actually breaking some rules here. It tells us on the left that the x-axis must be perpendicular to the previous z-axis, right? So we're currently breaking that rule. So we don't want to do this as this is not a valid frame to this kinematics diagram in order to be used for the Denevit-Hartenberg method. So we'll go ahead and we'll set that back to zero. Now that we're no longer breaking any of the rules for this frame, let's go ahead and add a third frame. By default, this frame will appear along the x-axis, or rather, sorry, the z-axis of the previous frame. But we don't actually want that. In this case, we want it to be above the previous frame in the y direction. So let's hit this to zero, and we'll make it go 20 on the y. So it is now above. Now you can see right off the bat, we're already breaking a rule. 
the x-axis must intersect the previous z-axis. Well, looking at this, clearly the red axis of the third frame, x2, is not going to intersect z1. What can we do to fix that? Well, just looking at it very quickly, I can tell that if I were to rotate this on the z by 90 degrees, I could fix this problem pretty easily. So let's go ahead and do that. And boom, we've now fixed that problem. So we have three frames in our kinematics diagram with no issues. So let's go ahead and let's add another frame. So we're going to add another frame. And again, by default, that ended up going to the z direction from the previous frame. We don't want that. So let's set that to 0. And this time, we actually want it to be 20 on the previous x-axis. So as you can see, it's above the previous frame. But in this case, we actually want this revolute joint to be perpendicular to its previous frame. So to do that, we can actually go to this y here and rotate it 90 degrees to get it to go the direction that we want. Now it's the direction that we want, but it's not following the rules. It says on the left that the x-axis must be perpendicular to the previous z-axis. OK, what can we do to get the x-axis to be perpendicular to the previous z-axis? Well, I know one thing we can do that's very simple is we can rotate this along the z-axis, either by 90 degrees or negative 90 degrees. Let's do negative 90. So as you can see, when I did that, let's just go ahead and set it back to 0 again so you can see. And now I'm going to set this back to negative 90. When I do that, it goes from x-axis must be perpendicular to the previous z-axis to a different rule that we're breaking. Now the x-axis is perpendicular to the previous z. You can see this red line is perpendicular to the previous blue line. But the x-axis does not intercept that blue axis. Now this is one of those uh, rarer cases, but it does come up, where you actually need to move the frame back in space. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's nothing I can do to possibly get this to work if I want this axis to be perpendicular to the previous one. So in order to do this, I actually need to take the frame and shove it back down such that I can follow the rules. So what I can do is actually click on this uh, checkbox here to say, OK, we're going to move the frame. We're going to move the frame back in the x direction. That's the red direction here. And we're going to move it back by negative 20. So you can see that what happened there is that you see there's a more opaque frame here for x3. We took x3's frame and we moved it back. The joint still might exist up in this space, but we moved the frame backwards. And by doing that, we are now following all of the rules. So you can see that by doing things like this, we can slowly start to define our kinematics diagram. But we haven't really started talking about the Denevit Hartenberg method yet. Let's take a look at the right side of the screen and talk about what's going on there. So as I've been doing this, the calculator on the right has basically been using the frames to determine what the Denevit Hartenberg table should be. So you can see that we have four columns in the Denevit Hartenberg table. We have theta, alpha, r, and d. What do these things mean? So if we look at the Denevit Hartenberg parameters, it tells us what is theta? Theta is the rotation around z, n minus 1, that is required to get the axis of x, n minus 1 to match the x axis of the n frame. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the first two frames, we can see that we have the two red arrows, which are our x axes, right? And this is saying we want to make it such that both those red axes are lined up. And how are we going to do that? We're going to rotate the previous frame, in this case x0, by a certain amount to get them to line up. Now you can see that there's nothing I need to do here, because both these red lines actually face the same direction. So we would put a 0 in the table for this. And you can see the calculator did that for us. But if you notice, alpha is 90. So let's take a look at what alpha means. Alpha is the rotation around the x n frame, which in this case is the x1 frame. This is required to get the axis of the z n minus 1 to match the z n axis. In other words, what do we need to do to the first frame by rotating it? to get the two blue lines to match up. Well, clearly, if we take a look at that, and remember that this specifically says we're rotating 
around the Xn frame. So in this case, we're going to rotate around the second red arrow, but we're going to rotate the first frame. Well, we're going to do this by rotating that first frame by 90 degrees. If we rotated that frame by 90 degrees, then this blue arrow will be facing in the same direction of the second blue arrow. Therefore, if I do that, both the Zs will match up and I will uh, be passing this rule. So we put 90 degrees in alpha. Next, let's take a look at R. R is the distance between the center of the two frames around, along the Xn direction. So Xn, that is the second frame here, right? Because Xn minus 1 is the first frame, right? And what is the distance between the center of the two frames along this red direction of that second frame? Well, there is nothing, so we put a zero there. In the next one, for D, we need to look at the distance between the center of the two frames along the Zn minus 1 direction. So Zn minus 1, that's the first frame here, right? And what is the distance along that z-axis to the next frame? Well, we know that. It's 20. We actually defined that. So we put a 20 in this box. So I just walked you through manually how I can look at these frames, and I can fill in those boxes. But the calculator, as I define my frames in the left, will do it for me. That's one of the beautiful things about this, is I don't have to think as much, because as I define my frames, I can see it building the denovit hartenberg table for me on the left. So eventually, after doing this over and over again, you're going to end up uh, with a full-fledged robot. Let's go take a look at one. Let's take a look at, for example, this example robot. So this example robot, you can see, has a bunch of frames. It has uh, actually seven because there's six plus the end effectors frame. And in this case, we have a full denovit hartenberg table that got defined for us. Now, what's cool is after defining the denovit hartenberg table, there's actually a method for defining or generating those homogeneous transformation matrices from that table. And that is done via this method. You can see we have denovit hartenberg transformation matrix. So what you basically do is for each row in the denovit hartenberg table, you are going to fill in this transformation matrix. So in this case, you can see this is cosine of theta. So the first one is going to be the cosine of 0. The second one says I want the negative sine of theta times the cosine of alpha. So that's going to be the negative sine of uh, 0 times the cosine of 90. So on and so forth, you would fill in all of these boxes. But uh, instead of doing that all manually, what this calculator will do for you is it will actually define those homogeneous transformations for you by basically taking these numbers from the denovit hartenberg parameter table, plugging them into each uh, table row by row, and it outputs them down this homogeneous transformation matrices section. And you can see that sometimes you might have uh, things become like zero because the sine of, on the first row, the sine of zero and times the cosine of 90, which is zero, uh, will result in zero. So you can see it just basically turns those into zero because it knows it will become zero. Now what's cool about this is after I define these homogeneous transformation matrices for each um, frame, we can actually start to uh, define a, a final homogeneous transformation matrix by dot multiplying them all together. And in the yellow on the right, you can see the end effector's position. We're doing forward kinematics. So to prove this, what I can do is I can actually go down here and I can see that I have joints that I can rotate. Let's say, for example, I rotated J0. Well, if I rotate J0, you can see that the robot is starting to rotate, right? And as I rotate that frame, you can actually see that in the first homogeneous transformation matrix, the cosine is now not just zero, but zero plus our angle. And you can see that theta is changing here, where in this case, theta is the angle defined in this input on the left. Now, if I scroll down to the bottom, as I change J0, 
we're not seeing any changes to the end effector's position. That's because the end effector's position isn't changing when I change J0. But what would happen if I changed J1? You can see that now we're starting to get a uh, less height because we're actually, the robot's moving down and it's moving in the negative X direction. If I spun it the other direction, you can see that we're also going down in the Z and we're moving forward in the, uh, in the X direction. If I were to then rotate J0, we're going to see a change on Y because we're starting to move it in the Y direction. And if I scroll to the top and you can see our homogeneous transformation matrices, as I change those variables, they change inside of the homogeneous transformation matrix and the math that's happening under the hood is seen in real time on the screen. So you can see when I change J0, it's changing the homogeneous transformation there. When I change J1, it's changing it there. And all of these things are getting dot multiplied together to result in these three yellow boxes, which is the end effector position for our six axis robotic arm. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, and I hope you guys take advantage of this calculator to play around with the Denefit Hartenberg method and uh, use it to assist you to prove out different kinematics diagrams, which you can see by going up to the top here, we can go ahead and grab maybe the universal robot UR3E. You can sc scroll up on that and see that we have a completely different kinematics diagram, but it's also following all of the frame rules and we have our Denefit Hartenberg table and we have the position of our end effector. One more thing to note is you can actually play with these switches over here to turn it off on and off something like the main grid. You can go ahead and show the links of the robot and you can even take an increase. Let's say I wanted to add a base to this of like, you know, 10. You can add a base to this, which raises the uh, base of the robot. That base will actually affect the uh, D here. So you can see as I shrink that, it's actually changing the value of that D. And another thing is I can actually increase or decrease the distance to the end effector here. So if I actually increase or decrease that, you can see that the end effector's position is growing or shrinking, and that's also affecting the Denevit Hartenberg table on the right. So again, hope this helps. Um, let me know what you guys think uh, in the comments section. Uh, subscribe to the channel, Robot.js, and I hope to see you guys in the next video.